Hello, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Lauren Siruan. I'm the Student Services Coordinator at AUYS. This information session is about the Fulbright Scholarship and is organized by the Communications Department at AUYS along with the Student Services Department um, and is hosted by Mr. Amiral and Mrs. Amina from Amit East. Um, quickly, before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone, our viewers, that if you have not yet subscribe to our YouTube channel, please do so now so you do not miss any of our webinars. Um, Ms. Amina, um, Sarah Miral, thank you so much for taking the time for be and being with us here today. The platform is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Lauren. Uh, hello and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining this uh, live session. Uh, and welcome to this uh, Zoom meeting hosted by the American University uh, in Iraq, Sulaymaniyah. Uh, my name is Amiral Ibrahim. I'm the senior program manager at Amid East. And my colleague joining uh, today with me, Ms. Amina from our office in Baghdad, we will be presenting this uh, session uh, together. Before uh, I begin the presentation, I would like to uh, thank uh, Ms. Dilawid and Mr. Lawen for their help in arranging and coordinating this uh, presentation. I'm very happy to be uh, doing this presentation uh, one more time again with American University. I've been to the great university before a couple of times doing uh, presentations in person, but unfortunately because of COVID-19, we have to do this now uh, virtually, we should be fine. I and mean, hopefully next time we will do another in-person uh, presentation. Uh, we are here today to talk about or to present a great uh, academic opportunity that uh, enables qualified uh, Iraqi uh, individuals, young professionals, to travel to the U.S., to live there for up to two years, to study in an American university, to obtain a master's degree program, and also participate in cultural uh, uh, activities while they're uh, in the U.S. The program we are presenting is Fulbright Foreign Student Program. It's funded by the US Department of State. And to give you uh, some background information, this program was uh, established back in 1946 uh, under legislation introduced by former Senator J. William Fulbright of Arkansas. So as you can see, this program has been running since 1946, a long time ago. In fact, 2021 marks the 21st, uh, the 75th, excuse me, anniversary of the Fulbright program uh, uh, in the world. Uh, as I mentioned briefly, the Department of State uh, sponsors this uh, program. And what the program does, it uh, offers grants to four groups of people, US students, US scholars, foreign students, and foreign scholars. In Iraq, unfortunately, this program is only like one-way exchange. It only uh, sends Iraqi students and Iraqi scholars uh, to the US. Hopefully someday in the future, the, the program will be both ways. Uh, the purpose of the program uh, is to promote cultural exchange between the United States and other nations. And that's through the uh, academic uh, opportunities and it hopes to create improved uh, relations among uh, nations. Uh, in Iraq, Fulbright uh, program uh, is uh, administered by Amid East. We are doing the uh, recruitment and promotion uh, on behalf of the US Embassy in Baghdad. And we have had the honor and the privilege to be working on this program for over uh, a decade now. Uh, the, as I said, the program uh, was established a long uh, time ago and like hundreds and thousands of people have benefited from this uh, uh, study opportunity from a variety of countries. Uh, over 160 countries are participating in the Fulbright program. Uh, to give just a brief explanation or background history of Fulbright in Iraq, in November 2003, the US Department of State reinstated the Fulbright program. 
Uh, and in that year, 25 Iraqi students were selected and were sent to the US to study and they started in 2004. And the program has been running annually uh, with, uh, with no interruption uh, since then. Each year, the program reopens for applications in uh, around uh, early to mid-February and is open for application until uh, the end of April or uh, early May. All right, so moving on. The uh, benefits of the Fulbright uh, program, uh, I think you can, uh, you got some information uh, what people can get out of the Fulbright program, but just to reiterate some of the points, it gives qualified individuals the chance to experience life in the United States and share their unique culture and traditions. You can see from this point that the Fulbright program isn't just about going to the US and doing a master's program. Part of it is a cultural uh, experience, a traditional experience uh, for uh, people to you know, experience and share while they're in the US. This, since this is an academic program, it's fully, uh, and it's fully funded. So uh, to, there will be tuition uh, provided, and then there's a living stipend for students who are selected. There are also academic allowances and also travel uh, funds. So your, the, the whole experience or the whole uh, program is fully funded, uh, funded, excuse me, as a participant or as an applicant to the, uh, to the program, you are not required to pay uh, any fees. Uh, additionally, there are cultural and professional enrichment uh, activities uh, that are happening on the Fulbright uh, Foreign Student Program. We have a few slides, uh, next few slides, where, uh, where we will show you what we mean by those cultural and professional uh, enrichment activities. Uh, you can also, as on a Fulbright Program, join a lifelong alumni network of global leaders. As I mentioned earlier, the program has been you know, has been there since 1946. Hundreds and hundreds of people from all over the world have benefited and participated from this uh, uh, academic uh, exchange program. And many of those are now uh, in important you know, places who've had uh, you know, opportunities since they came back from the program. So that gives you the chance to join that elite group. Uh, additionally, when, you, when you've participate in Fulbright and you successfully graduate, you will be eligible or entitled to apply for grants. But that happens after you successfully finish the program and after you return uh, home. Uh, not gaining knowledge and experiences while you're in the US and using that to help your, uh, your home community is also part of the benefits of the Fulbright uh, Foreign Student Program which you can you know, see from these points that coming back to Iraq is actually uh, one, of, uh, one of the important things or one of the requirements from applicants to uh, keep in mind and to remember and to abide by. Uh, obviously, uh, living and studying in the US for up to two years will definitely help you improve your English language skills but please uh, remember that the program is, is not uh, like uh, designed to help you learn English in the US because when you apply, your English language uh, level should be high enough to take certain exams and do well and do the interview in English and be able to start academic studies in the US uh, with, with the language. But when you're there, that will help you improve uh, your English uh, further. There is a section uh, about English language that we will talk more about in the next few slides. Increase employment opportunities when you return uh, to Iraq. We know from experience, we've been administering this program uh, since 2010, and we know many Fulbright, Iraqi Fulbright alumni students who are now working in important places, so with, uh, whether it's within the government, within the private sector, with NGOs, with consulates. And we do believe that uh, Fulbright alumni, because they will get a, a Fulbright certificate and also a master's degree from an American university, they will have, let's say, more uh, doors of opportunities open for them in terms of uh, 
work. And there are also opportunities for professional development and research at uh, US universities. Okay, so this is a slide about long-term English language programs. And we're gonna discuss and uh, give you more information what that LTE program is and how will it help applicants with the full by foreign student program. This LTE program is a, like a micro program that comes before the Fulbright grant and it's designed to help a select number of applicants who, who, has, who have submitted a competitive application, who've done you know, well on, in the interviews, on the tests, but they just haven't received the exact test score. An example would be when you, uh, when you are asked to take the TOEFL test, for example, after you're selected, uh, the program may say, okay, we need uh, 80 out of 100, but then you do not get 80, but you get about like 70 or 75. Uh, the, this program, you will be, uh, let's say, eligible to be considered for an LTE program. Uh, to help you improve your English language skills, retake the test, and then uh, wait for university admission decisions. The LTE program happens in the United States. So when you apply for Fulbright, you go through the application and selection process. If you're selected for an LTE program, you will travel to the US ahead of time and do uh, about six to eight months of intensive English language courses to help you improve your English uh, language. Uh, who will be eligible for LTE? As I said, the seats are very limited. It's usually one or two seats each year just for the LTE. Uh, individuals would be Fulbright applicants who have the foundational English language skills, uh, but they do not have a very competitive TOEFL score for university admissions. Universities usually have a cutoff score for students. When you apply for Fulbright, your language test may get you through the application process, the interview process, but that uh, test score may not be good enough for universities. So the LTE program will help you, you know, fix that uh, issue. Uh, to be eligible, you first have to apply for Fulbright program to study in the US. And then you will be nominated by MEDs for an LTE program. And uh, the factor or the, the decision will, uh, will be based on the quality of your application uh, and your uh, language test score. Uh, and the language test score will be the IBT, the International TOEFL test, uh, because you will be required to take that test. And let's say you do not get the exact test score, but you have a competitive application, strong application, the program may give you uh, the LTE program to help you improve your English. Uh, it's important to know that when you are nominated or when you're selected for an LTE program, it doesn't mean that you have a guaranteed admission uh, you know, into an academic studies uh, in the US. Because as I mentioned earlier, when you get the LTE, you travel to the US before universities have made decisions about who they would select to study for masters. You're, all, you're going there to work on your English, retake the test, and then wait for universities to make a decision. This hasn't happened like I don't recall this happening like for Iraqi students, but it's possible. You may spend, let's say, several months in the U.S. improve your English, doing well on the test when you retake, but there may not be a university admission. But that's very unlikely because uh, Amidis will work with you on your application to universities, and we will you know, make sure that you select universities that are realistic, that, that, that you can meet the requirements uh, so that your chances of acceptance by them uh, are higher. Uh, dependents may not allow a company LTA participants. The Fulbright program only sp sponsors uh, students who get the grant. Uh, family members, spouse, children are not allowed to accompany the student uh, to the US. Uh, benefits, uh, needless to say, improving your English language uh, score, and on average, we've noticed that 
the LTE program can help students increase their TOEFL test score by 20%. Okay, the, the, the following few uh, slides are about activities that are happening on Fulbright program in addition to uh, just academic studies or just living in the US. Uh, enrichment seminars, here's an overview. Uh, the enrichment, uh, the first seminar that usually, let's say, uh, invites all Fulbright students who are in their first year of study in the US uh, to Washington, they invite the students to Washington, and usually participants would be coming from 70, uh, from, sorry, 45 countries. Uh, the benefits of the enrichment seminars will be to give the student the chance to experience another part of the United States, because students are usually placed in different parts, cities, states of the U.S. Uh, so, those who go to this enrichment seminar in the in Washington, uh, it, they have the chance to see, let's say, another part of the United States. In those uh, seminars, they have the chance to attend lectures, hear keynote speakers, and participate in panel discussions and workshops. Uh, they can also uh, develop a better understanding of U.S. life and culture because part of that enrichment seminar would be focusing on uh you know relevant topics uh community engagement activity participation is also another part of those enrichment seminars uh, visiting american host families staying with them or let's say having dinner with them alumni mixers and expert panel discussions are also part of the enrichment seminar there's also a uh, part of the enrichment seminar will be taking part in local community service or civic engagement projects such as really cleanups and visits with the state uh, legislators. I will share with you uh, like a few pictures to just show you what I mean by those activities or what happens on those enrichment uh, seminars. Uh, this, yeah, this seems, uh, this is definitely a group of Fulbright students, you know, doing some community service uh, project, which should, which is part of the enrichment seminar. Uh, a couple of Fulbright students visiting an American uh, family, a host family, to connect, to have dinner with them. Uh, and this is, should be a group of Fulbright students, you know, going out and about, enjoying another part of the U.S. while they are attending that seminar. And this is a Fulbright student meeting, uh, you know, government uh, or officials. And then Fulbright students or alumni speaking at the enrichment seminar. Now, in addition to the enrichment seminar, uh, there are other activities happening on the program. Uh, and one, uh, one other activity would be uh, other seminars or conferences uh, to which Fulbright students will be invited to attend while they are doing their academic studies. And I don't want to like uh, talk too much about this because it's really like very early in the process. But hopefully, when you apply and you get the grant, you will be informed ahead of time what opportunities and chances are there, and Amadeus will be sure to communicate those opportunities to you so you can sign up or and participate. Okay. Now, moving on, the purpose of the program. I think we've now by now mentioned uh, what the purpose of the program is. So we're gonna like skip that uh, presentation, uh, that slide, and then move on to the next slide. And from here onwards, Amina, I think this is where you wanted to take over the uh, platform. Yes, thank you, Amina. Okay, no problem. So my colleague Amina will uh, handle the next uh, several slides and then I will take over. Amina, go ahead. Thank you. So uh, for the fields of study, here we can see a lot of fields of study. We cannot mention them all, but as you can see, there's a lot of different uh, kinds of uh, like fields you can join uh, within this program. So um, if we move to the other slide, please. Yes. Uh, here is what can I study and why. Uh, so for you cannot study uh, those things mentioned like medicine, uh, dentistry, 
pharmacy, nursing. So what is the uh, idea behind why cannot you study those fields? So this program requires a clinical patient interaction. So, which is not allowed for the visa status that Fulbright guarantees fall under. Furthermore, some of these programs cannot be completed within the maximum length of, uh, for a Fulbright grant, which is two years. Um, usually, you know, the medicine or the pharmacy uh, takes a lot of uh, time, like uh, five years uh, or more. So the Fulbright covers two years only, so it cannot be under the Fulbright program. As the uh, second reason is it needs like a clinical uh, patient and this is not all under uh, the um, visa status that the Fulbright grantees uh, have. So the programs such as public health or nursing administrations, which don't have clinical requirements, so are permitted. Okay, so the, for the financial uh, things that included, uh, as Emerald mentioned uh, previously, Tuition and mandatory fees. Uh, this is like a monthly stipend for all the uh, uh, students. Uh, Predetermined monthly life stipend based on location in the US. So basically the uh, monthly stipend will be different from uh, like uh, from another uh, students to another one because it's uh, depends on your location. For example, if you live in uh, uh, in New Jersey and the other uh, students lives in Chicago, for example, you will not expect to receive the same amount. So this is really like common. So uh, it's all uh, those uh, types of sty stipends all uh, like uh, counted well and you cannot uh, ask for additional fee as we will gonna to explain uh, uh, like in what is not included. So for the books, equipment, travel allowances, it's all included. Uh, paid air fees to the uh, uh, U.S. and the beginning of the grant and the forms of the U.S. at the end of the grant. Uh, so at the beginning, when you're going to travel to the U.S. and after ending the program, when you're going to to move from U.S. and go back to your country, it's all paid. Uh, paid university provided health insurance and another health benefits. So for not included annual air fees, or for example, if you wanna to do international travel uh, during the program, it's not included. Uh, so luggages, if there's an extra additional shipping there uh, for books, if you gonna order, for example, more books, you, it will not be included also. Additional living stipend, as I mentioned before, it's all well counted uh, from the beginning of the program and it's well enough for the students uh, who live uh, uh, there during the program. So you will not be able to ask for additional living stipend for any reason. So um, why Fulbright? Um, if you ask yourself, why shall I like apply for Fulbright? Uh, there is, uh, if you join like a global network of scholars, students, professionals, interact with a larger Fulbright alumni community, and to be part of one of the most prestigious exchange programs in the world. For example, we have a lot of famous people who join the Fulbright and become really like known. And it acts as a cultural ambassador for Iraq and represents your country, uh, your American university campus and community. 
So return to Iraq as a leader and contribute to developing and moving your country forward. And even I want to add uh, like the Fulbright a program score will uh, like if you put it in your CV and you apply for work, it's really uh, like give you a privilege for that since you are a Fulbrighter um, and uh, you will definitely uh, like have the the uh, the job. Yeah, thanks, Samina. Uh, so just definitely like if you have, uh, we're hoping that when you have a Fulbright certificate, a master's degree in the US, that should give you like better uh, chances with employment when you return. I did, I don't, I wanted to just uh, add a few notes to uh, why you should ap apply for Fulbright and how prestigious or, uh, you know, famous this scholarship is worldwide. Uh, there are like, there are many notable alumni from this uh, program from all over the world. And just to share with you some numbers, 57 Fulbright alumni from dif uh, different countries, like from 14 countries so far, have been awarded the Nobel Prize. Uh, 82 Fulbright alumni have received it to date uh, the Pulitzer Prizes, and 37 Fulbright alumni have served as heads of state and, and uh, governments. Uh, as a Fulbright uh, grantee, when you become an alumni, you will be joining a group of more than 3,000 uh, student Fulbrighters from around the world. Uh, more importantly, you will be joining a select group of people who have shared the, uh, this experience in the past uh, um, half cent century or so, including uh, like famous individuals like uh, Kofi Annan. He was the uh, recipient of the J. William Fulbright Prize for International Understanding in 2001, and also uh, Ms. Hanan Ashrawi, a famous Palestinian uh, legislator, ad activist, and uh, a scholar. And to uh, just add more on the last point, returning to Iraq as a leader and contribute to developing and moving your country forward, uh, the program really believes that uh, the knowledge and the skills that you learn in the U.S. on the Fulbright uh, program can definitely uh, help improve things uh, here back in Iraq. And that's why you, as a participant, you are uh, required to uh, return to Iraq. And while we're talking about the requirements, I'd like to uh, take the opportunity and just mention a couple more policies that the Fulbright program has for applicants from uh, Iraq. And uh, another, like in addition to the requirement to show the intention that you're coming back to Iraq would be a two-year two home residency requirement, meaning after you finish the Fulbright program, you're expected to return to Iraq and stay for, let's say, up to two years uh, before you're able to, uh, you know, uh, apply again or apply for another opportunity to go back to the U.S., Another policy that I mentioned earlier as well is the no dependence policy. When you apply for this program, please keep in mind that when you select it, when you go through the competition and you become a selected uh, student or, or a grantee, you will not be allowed to uh, take your family uh, with you. So you should keep that uh, in mind before you go too deep into the process. So um, for the other slide is, can I apply? There is a lot of things you have to be eligible for the program to apply. So you must be an Iraqi citizen living in Iraq throughout the application, selection and placement process. So in, uh, from the application till the placement process, you have to live uh, to, to, to be in Iraq and to have like uh, Iraqi documentations. Hold a BA or a BS degree from the university recognized by Iraqi Ministry of Higher Education and Scientific Research in Baghdad. Uh, possesses a strong academic background, have at least two years of full-time work experience after graduation 
So you have to, like if, if you have a work experience before graduated, it will not be counted. You have to have the, uh, like the work experience after graduation. Um, have a strong, like, uh, uh, English language, be able to attend long-term English LTE, um, as Emerald mentioned before. Uh, so uh, you have to get at least 80 on the IBT TOEFL or 65 on IELTS. So you have to write original research objective and personal statements copying from the uh, internet of taking or taken from another source uh, without mentioning it, it will be considered at plagiarism. And the plagiarism uh, will not, will you, you will be uh, immediately like disqualified from the program. Uh, demonstrate a clear communicate a commitment to return back to Iraq after completion of your study. Uh, Amadeus' staff and the employees of the U.S. Department of State or the U.S. Agency for International Development, even their uh, immediate family members, will not be eligible to apply for this program uh, during the period of their employment. And until one year following of uh, termination of such employment, uh, all the applicants with disabilities encouraged to apply. Okay, thanks, Samina. Uh, definitely. Uh... Uh, app applicants with disability are strongly uh, encouraged to apply for the Fulbright uh, Foreign Student Program. The program or the sponsors of the program want to have diversity in the applicants pool. They want to have different people from different backgrounds and ethnicities uh, be represented in the uh, group of people who benefit from this uh, uh, program so they can also benefit their communities when they return to Iraq. This is a statement from ECA, Educational Cultural Affairs of the Department of State on, uh, on their commitment that they would like people that come usually traditionally from underrepresented audiences in all grants, programs and other activities uh, and in its workforce and workplace. Now the Fulbright program is sponsored by ECA and they want to uh, encourage, uh, as I said, diversity uh, in the group of people who are end up as beneficiaries of the uh, program. The opportunities that ECA presents are open to people regardless of their race, color, national origin, sex, age, religion, geographic location, socioeconomic status, disability, uh, sexual orientation, or gender identity. Uh, the beer is committed to fairness, equity, and inclusion. So yeah, this is uh, their uh, statement to encourage all qualified and uh, qualified and talented in individuals uh, to apply for the program, regardless of all of those uh, factors, because the program is opening its you know arms for uh, diversity and uh, people who need. Uh, let's say people with disability, for example, who may need uh, special accommodation or, uh, you know, uh, additional arrangements to be able to be successful on the program, they will get that, uh, that support uh, they need. So with regards to applicants with disabilities, the program uh, wants, as I said, to ensure that the uh, participants are uh, diverse and that all applicants from all kinds of backgrounds, including those who have disabilities, to apply for the program. Uh, disabilities could be, uh, you know, there are all kinds of uh, disabilities, and uh, the way they are like defining disability could be physical or mental impairment that's, uh, that limits one or more major life activities person with a record of such an impairment or someone 
being regarded as uh, having such an impairment. Uh, there are different uh, examples and categories of uh, disability, uh, physical disabilities uh, or impairments such as being deaf, blind, mobility impairment, dwarfism, developmental disability, autism, spectrum, speech impairment, psychiatric disorder, bipolar disorder, PTSD, anxiety. So the the uh, the purpose of the slide is just to let's say ensure applicants who have different kinds of or people with different kinds of disabilities that they are welcome to apply for Fulbright that they shouldn't worry that because they have a disability they won't be able to be successful on the Fulbright uh, program because as I mentioned the program will do its best to support uh qualified individuals with disabilities to participate in fulbright and to be uh, successful uh, participants additionally uh you know many universities in the us uh they have offices to help people with uh disabilities and they are making certain or uh, special accommodations for people such as uh providing note takers for the students who have learning disabilities removing uh, physical barriers to provide access to into classrooms, uh, providing course material in Braille for people who have uh, visual you know, impairment, uh, sign language for uh, sign language interpretation as well. Uh, so the Fulbright program may provide grantees with disabilities, with disability related accommodation on a case by case uh, basis. Uh, so I hope that if we have somebody in the audience who may have like a certain type of disability and who may think that, okay, they cannot apply for Fulbright because of that, please uh, proceed, continue to uh, you know, uh, start applying for the program and uh, contact program administrators to know what kinds of, uh, let's say, different accommodation can be made for you so you can uh, proceed with the rest of the uh, application. Okay, now what is required to apply for Fulbright program? Uh, the application for Fulbright program is online, fortunately, has, uh, so you can submit an application from the convenience of your home or your laptop. Uh, there are, you don't need to go to places to submit anything. Everything that you need to include in your application can be uh, taken care of uh, online. The application deadline, just so everybody knows, is May 1st, 2021. So there are about six uh, weeks left to uh, apply. The application should include uh, original research objective and personal statements. They shouldn't be plagiarized. Uh, those two statements are two pieces of writing that are key and they are really important uh, parts of the application form. Uh, research objective, that has to be original, meaning you write it yourself. And personal statement, again, it has to be written by you uh, as an applicant. Uh, we have a couple more slides coming up about you know, plagiarism and more details on research objective and personal statement. Uh, the application should also include official transcripts from all higher education institutions that the applicant has attended and the graduate and graduate of applicable because we know some people may already have a master's degree and they want to do another master's degree. So in that case, they need to include in their application a copy of their bachelor transcript and a copy of their master's uh, transcript uh, or certificate if they have it. Uh, a copy of your resume and CV or CV is important as well. Uh, for the review committee to know what your work experience is. As if you recall, Ms. Amina suggested that uh, or uh, discussed that one of the requirements or one of the conditions is to have at least two years of full-time experience after graduation. So we need a copy of that resume to know more about your professional uh, experience. Uh, copies of transcripts are also important because Again, one of the other requirements was to have a strong academic background. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we will need to see your transcript you know, and, and, and review your, uh, your documents to determine whether you have a strong academic background uh, or not. 
letters of recommendation are also needed in the application. Uh, the requirement is usually three, but if you cannot get three for any reason during the application, please be sure to uh, get at least two letters of recommendation before the deadline or on, uh, on the deadline. Uh, the other two items, passport copy is, uh, is not mandatory at this time or medical history form. That's a form that will be required after you are nominated. So our recommendation for now would be to focus on the rest of the application form, fill it out completely by, the, by or before the deadline, make sure it includes the personal uh, statement and research objective essays that are original and not plagiarized. Uh, it includes copies of your university documents and also a copy of resume with at least two letters of recommendation. If you have other documents that you would like to include in your application, feel free. There is space and a uh, place for them to be uh, uploaded. With regards to the passport, as I mentioned earlier, it's not mandatory. Uh, if you have, let's say, a passport that's expired, then do not get concerned about that. Just fill out your application, the name and spelling and everything according to your current passport. And then when, when you're selected and when you become a nominee, you will be asked to, to submit the uh, passport later on. So we mentioned uh, the word plagiarism on this slide. On this slide, we're going to talk more about what plagiarism is. And uh, before I go through uh, this slide, I would like to uh, inform all of our audiences. Amidis is uh, doing a, uh, a Zoom session tomorrow at 3.30. Uh, and that session is uh, especially about the essays and the plagiarism, the research objective personal statement essays and plagiarism. So if you are interested, I would recommend that you watch that presentation as well, because it's more about the content of the application and not general information like we do, uh, well, that we provide today. So plagiarism is copying or using someone else's work or ideas and pretending that they are yours without giving them credit. Uh, and that, like in our experience, unfortunately, it happens with many, many applicants each year. Uh, people uh, knowingly or unknowingly copy and paste and present something and they say, okay, th this is what I wrote, but in fact, they didn't. They just copied it from somewhere. So examples of plagiarism would be copying from a source word for word, copying a sentence or paragraph from a source and using it in your writing, using somebody's theory or example without giving them credit, without giving mentioning their names and copying text from an online sample essay and using it in their own. And this is the most common uh, way pe many people do uh, plagiarism. Now, plagiarism is, uh, is obviously, you, you know, pretending that it's something belongs to you, which it doesn't. So it's actually like stealing and it's cheating. And it's a very serious academic offense in the American educational system. And I think this is quite universal, like even in Iraq, uh, if your professor says, you know, write me an essay about something and you just copy and paste, some, you know, someone's work, that's against the rules and uh, it's not acceptable. So you should uh, avoid that uh, uh, or else <clears throat> your application will be disqualified. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right. So these are like some links about plagiarism, but I think you all get it, what plagiarism means. And it's, it's not a good thing and you should avoid it at all in your uh, application or in your essays. Uh, there is, I mean, I understand if let's say you write about a certain topic and you need somebody's theory or idea as an opening statement or something. You can do that, uh, but you have to you know, mention that. You have to somehow give them the credit, either within the uh, text that you write or somewhere at the end of the uh, writing in, in a list of uh, references. OK, now I want to go back uh, to the original research objective and personal statement just to explain briefly what those two uh, essays are and why they are needed. So the research objective uh, essay is usually a piece of writing in which you will, let's say, introduce yourself, who you are, where you come from, 
what is your professional and academic background, uh, why you're applying for Fulbright, uh, why have you, let's say, decided to study that specific field of study in the United States, and what do you plan to do with the degree and the knowledge when you come back to Iraq? So if you answer these questions with some details, you should be able to come up with a good research objective, telling the committee that reviews applications what your plans are for your future and how, let's say, how those plans match your background, and your current status and if everything you know, makes sense, if it's connected and that yes, indeed, you know what you're talking about and you know why you're going to the US and you plan to come back to Iraq because you have a plan uh, uh, on what to do with a degree. The personal statement is more like just uh, like very personal. It's uh, an essay in which, again, you introduce yourself, who you are, where you come from, what your life you know, has been like, what are your ambitions and, uh, you know, for the future, uh, etc. Uh, yeah, in the personal statement, you will have, you'll need to talk about yourself, talk all, you know, talk, mention the things that are like personal, that are, you know, specific to you, that you can that can make you stand out or you can, we can make you different from the rest of the applicants that you can, let's say, somehow attract the attention of the person who reviews the application to decide and say, okay, we would like to see that person and to get to know them you know, more. And as I said, I invite you to a, uh, another presentation tomorrow at 3.30 uh, from Amid East. It will be live on our Facebook page, Amid East Iraq. And that presentation will be uh, especially about research objective, personal statement essays, and how to avoid plagiarism. So I hope you can tune into that presentation tomorrow to learn more. Okay. So uh, this is a slide about where are the students placed in the United States. And this is just to show our audience that when you apply for Fulbright and if you are selected as a nominee or you become a grantee eventually, uh, these are the different universities or places in the US where Fulbright program places Fulbright students at. So you can, you can see there are like many, many different universities and Fulbright students will be placed in different parts of the United States and Fulbright students from certain countries or communities wouldn't be placed in the same place, in the same location. And so yeah, I mean, these are the some of the universities that the program will work uh, with to uh, get admissions or enrollments for Fulbright students. And this is another slide that shows the different states of the United States and you know how many Fulbrighters are approximately are placed each year in each state. <clears throat> okay, now this is a slide on the application and approval timeline, and I find this slide to be like extremely like, important for people who decide to apply for uh, the program, because uh, as you will soon know, the application and the approval process is quite lengthy. It takes um, like about a year and you know, a couple of months before you know for sure if you're selected or not. So you'll have, when you apply for Fulbright, you'll have to be you know, both patient and hardworking at the same time. Uh, the application deadline, the program has been open since February, early February, and it's going to be open for applications until May 1st. After applications are submitted, they will be reviewed by Fulbright staff, which that's you know, in early June. Uh, and between June and July, people will be, let's say, shortlisted for an English language test uh, before the interview process. If you pass that test and you get the required uh, test score, you will have a chance to attend an interview and the interviews are expected to take place in August. Uh, after the interview process, a list of names will be submitted to Washington and then sometime in October 2021, uh, you will know <laughs> if you have been uh, selected as a, uh, as a nominee or as a candidate for the program. Placement and admission, this process begins between November this year and March next year. That's uh, like quite a few months of really like uh, intensive and hard work. 
uh, during which you will be assisted by MEDs in the process of applying for universities. Uh, students who get the LTE uh, program will be uh, nominated and will be uh, notified and will travel to the US between January and May uh, next year. Uh, starting in April but until May, that's next year, students would know if they, uh, if they have received admissions from universities uh, in the US. And then once you know which university have selected your application or which university has given you admission, you will need to begin the visa application process. And that happens sometimes in April next year. Uh, after the visa process, almost all Fulbright finalists get a pre-academic or gateway program to go to the U.S. Uh, to attend before they begin their official academic studies for the master's degree. Uh, and then academic programs begin in August, September 2022. So you can see it's a very long process. When you apply, you'll have to be you know, patient. Uh, there are like many uh, processes and stages that you will have to pass successfully for you to stay in the competition towards receiving a Fulbright grant at the end. Uh, for more information on today's uh, featured program, you can go to uh, the U.S. Embassy website, the Exchange and Scholarship page. They have a page for Fulbright on which you can learn more about the program, the opportunity, uh, and other uh, details. If you have questions about the program in general, the application process, any issues or concerns in the process, you should contact Fulbright at MEDs.org so we can help you uh, resolve those issues and uh, give you answers to your questions. This is a slide on preparation mode for. Uh, students who wish to take the TOEFL or the GRE test uh, before they are really required, you should feel free. Uh, if you want to take certain exams that you think will be required for Fulbright, you should first check with, uh, I would suggest with Amidist uh, to confirm the test that you're taking to be sure that you're taking the correct test for the uh, program, but you are not required. Uh, when you apply for Fulbright, you can submit an application <clears throat> excuse me, uh, with or without a TOEFL or a GRE test score. If you are selected, you will be asked to take both exams. And at that stage, you will be, the test fees will be covered by the program and the registration process will also be handled by program staff. Okay, I think yeah, that's the that was the last slide, and this is Amity's contact information for our offices in Baghdad and Basra. So the phone numbers that you can reach out to, and then for Erbil we have a number for uh, emails for all Iraq, it's full by Iraq at Amity's.org, and we have staff that uh, responds to all emails that are received in our uh, inbox. All right, so that, yeah, that was the end of the presentation. Thank you very much again for being in our audience today. We will open up the platform uh, for questions now. And if uh, Mr. Lawen, like, do you want us to uh, start answering the questions? Do you have any, like, is there something that you would like to say at the end or should we go directly to questions? Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Amiral and Mrs. Amina for such an elaborate um, session. Thank you so much for uh, taking the time to be here with us today. And thank you for the viewers for being here with us. I hope that uh, everyone benefited from this. Um, I think we have several questions. I don't know if you see them uh, in our chat. Yes. Yes. Uh, um, please go ahead um, with the questions. Okay. Thank now, you. just a few minutes ago, I saw questions coming in within the chat Q&A uh, at my end. But right now I click on it and it says no open questions. So let me just look for answer, dismiss. Do you want me to read the read out the questions? Yeah, but right now, I mean, I saw questions, but they're, now they're no longer there. It's completely like blank, the questions and answers section. So if you don't mind, 
either you uh, can put, copy paste the questions again or you can just read them out to me and well, I, think, I think they're um, written in our chat could you if you open our chat uh, right below your screen I think you'll see them okay at the all right yeah yeah I found them Perfect. there was another section for this but it was empty so now I can see them within the uh, general chat section okay some yeah I mean I see some questions some really like good questions uh, the first question says, do AUIS students get special consideration for Fulbright? The answer, unfortunately, is no. Uh, nobody is given special consideration. The competition uh, is open for all qualified individuals from across Iraq who can meet all the eligibility uh, requirements that we outlined earlier today. Uh, I do want to say something, though, based on my experience reviewing applications for Fulbright, we have had, uh, you know, several alumni from AUIS who ended up receiving the Fulbright uh, grant, and that just, I think, speaks a lot for the quality of applications that are coming from AUIS. Uh, next question. What are some obvious to do's and not to do's applicants should consider? Okay, that's a good question. Our recommendation is when you begin the application for Fulbright program, the first thing you should do, you should read the application instructions uh, because the, the uh, online system, uh, which is called Slate that Fulbright program is using, is actually used by Fulbright applicants from other countries, by applicants to other kinds of Fulbright exchange programs that are out there. So uh, the best thing to do to know what is, what is to do and what's not to do is to read the application instructions because they've been uh, customized or uh, specified for Iraqi students. If you do not read the application instructions, I can expect that the, the experience of you know, creating an application and filling out the form could be a bit, uh, let's say, in certain parts may not be clear. You may have uh, many, many questions. Uh, but if you read the instructions, it just helps you like step by step what to do, what's now, what's next, and how to do it. And if there are issues uh, or questions that for which you cannot find answers in the uh, instructions, you can always reach out to uh, Amethyst and we will uh, help you. Uh, how tough is the competition and how many applicants are accepted uh, annually? This is a very common question that we receive about the number of applicants selected and, uh, annually. The, uh, yeah, the competition is actually quite tough. It's very, the program itself is very, very competitive. Uh, each year around like between 15 to 20 uh, grants are uh, awarded to, to uh, qualified individuals from uh, across uh, Iraq. And the, yeah, it is a very, uh, very competitive uh, program because each year, many, many, like hundreds of people apply for the program because of how uh, important, let's say, well-known and prestigious the Fulbright uh, program is. So there are many people apply and because the seats are very limited, it just makes the whole process very, very competitive. Uh, next question says, are there any follow-up programs for Fulbright alumni? Yes. Uh, Fulbright alumni will have different kinds of opportunities after they return from Fulbright, after they finish their uh, program successfully. There are at least some alumni, some grants that are only uh, given to Fulbright alumni, that, are, that only alumni are eligible to apply for uh, and, and receive. Uh, next question. What's the COVID situation? Do we have to study online or will we study in the US? This is uh, indeed a very, very good question. Uh, very, very relevant you know, to these days. Uh, in fact, the answer for that question would be uh, new applicants to the Fulbright program. They should be aware that you know, the the whole uh, conditions related to the public health, the COVID-19 
circumstances, availability of uh, visa services in Iraq, uh, travel restrictions, all of those, or even like the possible, the, uh, whether the universities in the US are open or not for in-person online classes, all of those will affect, uh, may affect the uh, Fulbright foreign student program for 2022, 2023. Now I will uh, give you just a couple of examples from the last round of Fulbright program. We had uh, about like maybe let's say 15 students and uh, many of those students started the program online uh, last fall because of COVID-19. And as soon as universities started to uh, open or to offer hybrid classes, the students were uh, allowed to travel uh, to the US. And I am you know, pleased to say that uh, you know, 99% of the students of the last round uh, eventually traveled to the US to do in-person classes, to graduate from the program in person uh, in the US and then hopefully uh, return to Iraq. But this is, yeah, something to keep in mind. Yeah, I mean, if God forbid a situation, you know, worsens with a pan pandemic, yeah, that's a possibility. You may have to start the Fulbright program online, virtually but you are still getting benefits of the program, um, say, uh, mean financial benefits while you're in Iraq to be, for you to be able to, to do it uh, you know, properly. And as soon as uh, the, your host university offers, uh, even if it's like part of the classes in person, then that will automatically entitle you to uh, travel and then Ambedist will help you with the travel arrangements, the visa application process, et cetera. Okay, uh, the, these are all the questions, uh, Mr. Lawen, that I see. Are there more or is that, yeah. that is it? I think that's it, Mr. Emiral. Thank you so okay. much for answering uh, our, our questions. Um, again, thank you uh, both Mr. Emiral and Ms. Amina for taking the time for being here with, with us today. Um, uh, we really appreciate it. Um, and thank you, the viewers, for tuning in. Uh, Mr. Amiral, if you have any, or Ms. Amina, if you, if you both have any uh, closing uh, statements, and I think that will be our session for today. Thanks, Mr. Lauer. No, it has been definitely like our pleasure to be, uh, to be working with, the, uh, with your university on promoting and uh, spreading the word about the Fulbright program. We are very, we are very happy to do that uh, in the future as well. We uh, appreciate the opportunity that you gave us today to uh, present this opportunity to interested uh, uh, people. Uh, I would suggest, uh, or I would like, I would like to ask you to feel free to share our contact information on your YouTube page for people to ask questions uh, later on. If they don't have any questions now. Other than that, yeah, I think yeah, no more comments from me. Thanks again. Uh, have a great day. I mean, if you have any questions, comments, or all, uh, otherwise, we will let uh, Ms. Dilawit and uh, Mr. Lawen uh, go as well. Yeah, thank you so much. And I don't have any further thing. Thank you. Perfect. Thank we'll you, guys. Sorry, we'll definitely put your uh, contact address um, on the YouTube page. Uh, we will also potentially send it to everyone who is interested at AUIS. Uh, they can just request it from me uh, through an email. All um, right. Thanks. Thank, thank you, you so much. much. Have a Have great a day. day. You too. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.